Here we have the fifth generation Toyota 4Runner Limited. Now it is a cold and sunny day here in Bethesda, Maryland, but we're gonna talk about this fifth generation 4Runner today, which by the way, was designed back in 2009, or rather was released back in 2009, and they've been selling relatively the same 4Runner ever since with some, some minor improvements along the way. Now the thing is with the 4Runner is that the 4Runner in general doesn't have a lot of creature comforts in it at all. It's not what you would consider a luxury SUV. It is an overlander. It is an off-road machine. It is competing with the likes of Range Rover, uh, or more specifically Land Rover, and like the Jeep Wrangler and stuff like that. Uh, but that said, people, despite the antiquities of the 4Runner, people still love it. They sell over 100,000 of these things a year. And it still has the same V6, the same five-speed transmission. It doesn't get particularly good gas mileage. It's a little bit underpowered. Again, it doesn't really have any luxuries to speak of, and yet people still lap them up. So today, what we want to find out is if the 4Runner is, in fact, any good, and if you should buy one yourself. Now before we get into the walk around of the 4Runner, let's go ahead and talk about some key differences on the 4Runner lineup. So the 4Runner comes with the entry level SR5, it goes up to like an SR5 Premium, then you have the limited model which is uh, typically purchased by soccer moms and real estate agents, and then you go up to the TRD Offroads and TRD Pro models which are the really, really cool looking ones that you always see floating down the road and very rarely off-road for some reason, but be that as it may, uh, there is basically something for everybody in the 4Runner lineup. Now, the key differences between uh, the 4Runners the are typically suspension, some of the creature comforts on the inside, or, or lack thereof, and uh, the, the drivetrain. So the limited model, which this one is, comes with an all-wheel drive system, not four-wheel drive, an all-wheel drive system. If I'm not mistaken, it's one of the only ones that has that. Now, it is also offered in a two-wheel drive model. And yes, believe it or not, the 4Runner is offered in two-wheel drive. I've never seen one out in the open, but it does exist. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. You'd think that, you know, 4Runner would be... Anyway, but then when you get into the uh, TRD models, you go over to a four-wheel drive system. Now, um, there have been a lot of tests online on the four-wheel drive system of the 4Runner and how it competes with the likes of like Land Rover and Jeep and stuff like that. And suffice to say, the 4Runners can really hold their own off-road. They are incredibly capable overlanding machines. Now, the other differences between like, let's say the Limited and the TRD models is the suspension. Now, the suspension in the Limited model is what's referred to as Toyota's x reas system. And effectively, it's a more luxury-oriented suspension system, but nevertheless, it makes it a lot more comfortable on the roads, especially the highways and stuff like that. I have to say that when you go over speed bumps or just when you're driving around in general, the ride quality in the Limited is absolutely exceptional. But then you go into the likes of the TRDs, where they have suspension systems that are a little more burly. They're meant for, for rock crawling. For example, you can disconnect the struts in them and then one of the tires drops down, you can get over a road and sort of reconnect, or get, get over an obstacle, sort of reconnect it back up again. Uh, so they have some really, really awesome off-roading features for the suspension there. Forerunners all come with rails at the top, which allow you to put some uh, crossbars on there if you ever wanna uh, move around some kayaks or skis or anything that you want, bikes, whatever it is that you wanna put on there. Uh, they all have a tow hitch in them as well. And then most of the 4Runners also come with running boards. The Limited has a chrome option. Some of the other ones just have black. And then, of course, you have the Nerf bars in the TRD model, which is sort of like a, it's kind of just like a cool rounded bar that you can kind of step up on. Uh, that's what I prefer. Well, let's go ahead and do a walk around of the 4Runner and talk about some of its quirks and features. So there's a couple of little details that one might want to know about the 4Runner. So on the limited package, it typically comes chromed out on the front here. Now on mine, basically what we've done is converted it over to something called a heritage grill. You effectively take the old Toyota, like normal looking bull logo off, and then you put this sort of plastic cover on there, put the old Toyota badge, and uh, then you sort of cover up some of the chrome here on the front. A lot of people don't like the chrome, so this is what's kind of considered a chrome delete package, if you will. Um, but 
Nevertheless, I actually kind of think the chrome looks pretty good, especially when paired with the army green, but I really, really love the way the Heritage logo looks, and that's why I opted to do that. I also have these wannabe three Raptor lights there in the front, and then of course, the taco badge to let everybody know that I'm the kind of person that can go off-road if I want to, but I seldom ever do. Now, the first thing you'll notice about the lights is that they are incredibly bright. Toyota has equipped the 4Runner Limited with, a, uh, with LED low beams and high beams. They are also automatic, so as you approach oncoming traffic, they can automatically go from high to low. Now, you do not get LED turn indicators, but you do get LED fogs. They are decently bright, but there are a number of aftermarket options out there if you really, really want to get some bright fog lights out there. A couple of other things on the front here, too, is you've got the little parking sensors here. You've got the uh, camera on the front here. Now, let's go ahead and talk about the cameras for a second. So on the SR5, there's something called a premium package, limiteds have it, and I believe also the TRD Pros. They have their sort of multi-terrain, uh, I think it's called like PVS camera system or something like this. Effectively what it is, is you've got a camera on the front, one in the back, and then two on the mirrors. And what they're supposed to do is kind of give you a 360 view of the car. Basically, if you're parking the vehicle, it allows you to make sure that you're lining up in the lines correctly, that you're not hitting something in the back, not hitting something in the front. But if you're also somebody going like rock crawling or something like that. It allows you to kind of get over obstacles and sort of see what might be in your way. The thing is, however, is that the camera quality is so piss poor that they are borderline useless. It's not just the quality of the head unit screen, but the cameras in general look like they were pulled out of a Nokia cell phone from 20 years ago. I really think that this was one of the biggest disservices that Toyota did to the 4Runner lineup in general. Those cameras are, I mean, they are literally borderline useless. I'll get into it a little bit more with the rear camera uh, review later, but suffice to say the image quality on all of them is atrociously bad to the point where they are borderline unusable. Uh, you also have this big square here in front and center. That is Toyota's TSS system. That is the Toyota Safety Sense. Basically, that's the uh, radar cruise control, among a few other things. Toyota Safety Sense basically includes lane departure. It includes uh, the radar cruise control, cross uh, uh, blind, blind spot monitoring, cross traffic alerts, and stuff like that. It all actually works fairly well. In fact, I'd argue that the TSS uh, radar cruise control works better than the Tesla, ironically. It's certainly right up there with the Civic. The steering wheel, when you do the lane departure, it doesn't have anything fancy where it tries to steer you back into the lane like the Honda Civics do. Uh, but nevertheless, it does a pretty good job of alerting you if you start to veer, veer out of the way. So uh, let's go ahead and pop the hood on the 4Runner. Now, one thing I love about the 4Runner right out of the gate is that they've got these two pistons that are holding up the hood. You don't have one of those little prop shaft things that you need to hold it up for. Everything in the 4Runner is incredibly serviceable. There is a lot of space going on here, so if you had to swap out something like your alternator, your fan, put in fluids, whatever it is, all these like little plastic panels and stuff, they pop right off very easily, and they are very, very serviceable. There is one thing worth noting, and that is that the uh, interior of the hood does not have a light on it. Now, if you had um, either Ford pickup truck, Ram, Range Rovers, these kinds of things, they all have a light uh, built into the bottom of the hood, so that way if you ever have to work on the vehicle at, uh, in, in nighttime, you can see what's going on in your engine bay. Now, I had a friend of mine joke around and say something along the lines of, well, you'll never need to service the Toyota at night because they never break down. And well, I guess it was kind of hard to argue his logic there, but nevertheless, for an overlanding vehicle, something that you're going to be taking into the Mojave Desert, you know, in the middle of the evening, it seems to me that they could have done a little bit of a better job of just giving you a little bit of, of light uh, inside the engine bay. But inside this engine bay, we are greeted with Toyota's 270 horsepower V6 engine that is equipped, of course, with the very controversial five-speed transmission. Now, this engine, as reliable as heck as it might be, has a paltry 17 to 19 miles per gallon. And that really is, not only is that the EPA rating, but that is generally speaking what you will probably get. Uh, I've also found that going up a hill, the engine is quite underpowered. And for that matter more, um, when you're also going up a hill, it tries to kind of battle between fifth and fourth gear a little bit, which can kind of tend to get a little bit annoying. All of the panels in the 4Runner, or most of them, are all made of steel, the, uh, except for some of the plastic ones in the front here. But nevertheless, it is a very, very burly, well-built car. It just kind of feels 
tough and really well put together. But the biggest complaint really in general about the Forerunner is that it's just an outdated platform and I can't help but exist in that camp myself. See, the fact is, is that this engine is bulletproof. It will in fact last for 200, 300,000 plus miles with no problem whatsoever. And the same would probably go with that transmission. But we are in 2022, almost hitting 20. This is a 2022 to 2023 year model. 2023 year models have the same thing. Uh, they have that five speed transmission. Most cars are now coming out with seven, eight speed transmissions easily. And it's one thing to have fewer gears, bad gas mileage and stuff like that. But it's, it's just the point is, is that uh, Toyota just seems to kind of be resting on its laurels with this platform, even though they have other vehicles that they've been testing other engines, other transmissions in, but they just refuse to put it on the Forerunner. And that's a little bit disappointing because the Forerunner is far and beyond one of the best looking SUVs that you can get on the market today and it's an incredibly capable off-road machine. So why they couldn't just give you a little bit of extra horsepower, just something to kind of give you a little, little more towing capacity, a little bit of better fuel economy, just something to make you feel like you're getting a little bit more bang for your buck. And it's true, this thing will be reliable as all get out, but you do start to see some of its antiquity when you're driving down the highway, when you're trying to pass somebody, when you're trying to tow something. It just shows its kind of age and I don't know, that's just a little bit disappointing. But anyway, that is the inside of the Forerunner engine bay. Let's move on to a couple of other things. So if we close the hood, by the way, it closes very, very easily. I did that with one hand. One thing I love is that it does not have the windshield washing uh, nuggets on the actual hood itself. It has the little nozzles. That's the word I was looking for. It has the nozzles baked into like basically underneath the hood here and they just kind of spray up. Another really cool thing is that underneath the, uh, the wiper blades, there is a heated element that you can turn on. Basically, if you live in like a snowy wintry area and you um, and there's a snowstorm and it freezes your windshield wiper blades down to the to the glass, you just hit this little button on the inside and it will it'll heat up the windshield wipers for you so you can brush that snow and ice off of your windscreen. Very, very nice touch. Now you do have these two little lines here which allow you to press that and it locks the vehicle. The other cool thing about this one is that if you just simply walk up to it, it unlocks it as uh, when you put your hand on it. Now there is also a nice feature that when you approach the vehicle, the lights will come on to sort of illuminate your path towards the car, kind of a nice little welcome home sort of thing. Uh, that whole opening or unlocking the door does not exist on the rear. So if you ever want to get into the back door, you have to quickly put your hand on the front one first and then open the back one uh, for that to work. But that said, here's the thunk. I don't know if it'll, if it'll pick up on the microphone, but I mean, that is a good thud. That is like, that's like the test of a good car, right? Is when it has like just a good, like solid thud when you shut the door. And the Forerunner has got one of the best. Thick. Now for those that are curious, this is what a Toyota 4Runner fob looks like. Pretty basic, no frills. You just have the lock, unlock, and emergency button on there. Now this 4Runner does have remote start. If you press the lock button three times and then hold it, it remote starts. Now that is an obscene amount of time to remote start the vehicle. It also doesn't have that great of range. If I was over probably just about another, I don't know, like 50 yards that way, the remote wouldn't even work, which is kind of a shame. Another really stupid thing about the remote start on the 4Runner that Toyota claims is a safety feature is that it cuts off when you open the door. Now the reason why that is so dumb is because you may want to continue heating the vehicle or cooling it down if it's the summer while you're still putting things in and out of the truck. But no, Toyota claims that as a safety feature, it cuts the vehicle off so somebody can't get in the truck and drive away with it. Except in the Dodge Ram, it just simply wouldn't let you put it into gear, but it would still keep the car running. So yeah, remote start on the 4Runner is just about useless. The other kind of worthless thing about it is that you can get the Toyota app when you, when you buy the car, they want you to download the app. And in the app, they have remote start among some other features, maintenance schedules and things like that. But the app is only free for the first year. You have to start paying for it after that. Toyota claims that the remote start on the FOB is free for the first five years, I believe it is. And then you have to start paying for that afterwards. 
Now, the thing that I don't understand is how Toyota can possibly regulate the remote start on the fob. It doesn't really make a lot of sense, but supposedly they are and they will. And um, anyway, I just kind of feel like it's a little bit of a money grab, kind of like BMW charging for your heated seats. Now, the back of the 4Runner has a couple of things worth talking about. So for starters, you've got the little backup rear sensors here that basically lets, and you do have those on the front as well. Basically, it lets you know when you're about to back into something when you're parking. Uh, it has a tow hitch on the bottom that is standard, love that. Now, one feature on the Limited that I really love are these two little buttons right here. And those act, they're sort of a double feature. Basically, they allow you to lock and unlock the car, but they also allow you to roll down the window, which is one of the 4Runner's top selling features. Roll that down and up as well. But there is a small quirk with that. First thing, it will only work if the power is off, which makes no sense to me. If the car is running, you cannot use these buttons to roll the window up and down. I guess Toyota assumes that you're just gonna use the button on the inside of the car. But the other interesting thing is, is that if you have one of the doors open, you can roll the window down, but then you can't roll it back up again. It kind of gets confused thinking that it can't lock the doors. Uh, sort of a sloppy Toyota-ism as far as that's concerned, but nevertheless, something worth pointing out. Turn indicators on the rear are not LED, but the rear lights are. You've got some fairly bright enough lights on the bottom here. You've got the rear wiper blade, which I think very cleverly will recess itself into the housing up here. That kind of prevents it from getting nasty and dirty and then frozen onto the windscreen. And also, of course, because the glass goes up and down, they don't want to keep it on there. So that's really, really clever. But I have noticed that in rain, it doesn't exactly do the best job at keeping the glass clear. But again, do does what it needs to do. Uh, other thing is too, one of my, another one of my complaints about the 4Runner is that it has the rear camera right here underneath the, the uh, 4Runner logo. Now, that is kind of common for SUVs to sort of recess it below the logo or kind of near the license plate area. But there's one reason why it is a problem with the 4Runner. There is something about the sort of dimensions, shape measurements of the 4Runner that when you have a bike rack onto it, it will cover that rear camera. That was not really an issue on the Ram and it wasn't an issue on any of the other SUVs that I've had and or tested, including Range Rovers, uh, Ford Explorers, any of those. It is only a problem really on the 4Runner. And it's bad enough that the quality of the camera is so crappy, but then you've got a bike rack covering it too. It almost then makes the rear camera pretty much worthless. So yeah, that is something that I really, really hope Toyota will work on in a future ver in the future. Forerunner is maybe recess the camera in the the logo here or something along those lines. Uh, but this camera also gets very, very dirty very, very quickly, and will artifact with light in it too. Another stupid thing to point out about the rear camera is that the license plate light, which is right here, shines on it at night. So that way, when you are trying to back into your driveway in the pitch black dark, there is sort of a kind of an angle on the rear camera that's, that's being obstructed by the light and, uh, and, and the camera is kind of exposing for it. So really, really dumb, dumb thing there. Now the inside of the 4Runner has got a few things that are worth mentioning. One thing I wish SUVs had these days was a tailgate. Now the 4Runner does not have a tailgate, but it almost has a tailgate. This is a very deep and very, very nice kind of like sitting area back here. It's actually one of the best that exists on an SUV that doesn't have an actual tailgate like the Range Rover does. So I think that's pretty neat. And if you have one of the options that you can buy on a 4Runner Limited is the cargo deck that sort of like pulls in and out of the trunk space. And you can also sit on that. It has something like a 400 pound limit on it. This particular Limited does not have the cargo deck, nor does it have the third row seats, but those are both options that you can get. Now, underneath the mat here, it is pretty bare bones. There is no hidden storage, no compartment or anything to that effect. Uh, and that is actually something that I kind of don't like about the 4Runner. There is not a lot of storage space in general. I had a Ram that had so many little hidden pockets and compartments and stuff like that, you could lose your sh stuff in it. You can't really do that in the 4Runner. Uh, but that said, the 4Runner does have these little like tie down latch things right here. It also has an actual power outlet here too, uh, which is 400 watts, which is incredible. It's a lot of good power there. You hit a little button by the steering wheel and that turns it on. You've got a conventional cigarette lighter there as well. And then that's pretty much about it. There's no real easy way to get the rear seats down. Uh, if you want to lower the rear seats while you're back here, you have to sort of reach in and then hit the little button and it goes down. 
But like typical Forerunner stuff, there's nothing automated, nothing electric, nothing, no little frills or buttons or anything like that that you can press. No, the, about the best feature that you have is this little strap which allows you to, if you're, I guess, in the Forerunner and you want to close the, the, the lid, you can just sort of grab a hold of that and close it. Well, let's go ahead and talk about the inside of the Forerunner. This particular model Forerunner comes with the Redwood leather interior. That is basically a brown and it is, well, it is incredibly handsome. I think that it is the best looking color that you can get in a Forerunner. Rear seats though are pretty much no frills. There is absolutely no luxury to speak of back here. You do have a couple of USB ports back here. They are the original traditional USB-A, they're not USB-C. You do have this little like net thing back here, which allows you to store a document, I guess. Uh, all of the switches in the Forerunner are automatic. I do love that. I think that that should be a standard on all cars or automatic window switches. And I'll get into that a little bit more later. You have like a little, kind of pocket here for a, like a roll of quarters or something. You got a little place for your drink. The limited models also have a cup holder in the armrest, a cup holder armrest. And like the front of the car, they have these stupid drink expander things where basically if you've got a smaller cup, you can use this little filler rubber thing um, and then take that out if you have a slightly bigger cup. It does not have a storage space. It just has these little cup holder armrests that is kind of something that was nice about some of the other vehicles, the Ram, Range Rover, stuff like that. They have a, a compartment in the armrest, but nope, not in the Forerunner at all. But one other feature of the Forerunner, which is pretty nice, is that the rear seats do recline. So if you hit this little lever right here, you can, uh, there we go, recline the seat back here. That's kind of nice in a long road trip. But that said, headroom is, pretty good. I mean, I'm tall and I've got enough headroom back here. And legroom is pretty good too. You could sort of stretch out. You should be able to fit three people back here comfortably, but um, you know, it does not have the industry class leading leg space in the second row like the Telluride does. The rear seats do also have these little vents back here. However, there are no controls to speak of. So that means that if you want to adjust your temperatures or the um, speed at which the air comes out while well, you are just kind of SOL. Let's talk about the inside of the Forerunner, which like most of the vehicle, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with. Let's start with the steering wheel, which has one of my favorite features. See, on the left here, you well, like most steering wheels, you have a bunch of buttons on them these days. Basically, you can actuate a bunch of features. But on the Forerunner, you have the button on the left, which controls the track that you want to listen to as well as the volume. Now, one thing that I always find kind of curious about the Forerunner button is that the volume is on the left and the right, but the track is on the up and down. Now, why that is weird is to me is because intuitively speaking, somebody always goes, turn up the volume or turn down the volume, go to the next track, go to the previous track. They don't say, turn the volume right, turn the volume left, go to the up track or the down track. It just seems a little backwards. It's almost like Toyota went out of their way to intentionally flip the orientation of that button. Don't really know why. The other thing with the wheel, this is the limited trim. The top and bottom portions of this wheel are the same kind of rubber that you would get in a rental car. There's nothing really premium about it. And I get it, it's not a Lexus, but they managed to put this wood trim in other places. Why couldn't they put that on the steering wheel? And the other thing is too, is that the wheel in general is just not all that comfortable. When you are doing long distance road trips, there just isn't really a good place to kind of keep your hand. It's just, again, the wheel is just sort of big and uncomfortable and just not really that pleasurable to use. But that said, the horn, is nice and responsive, it's nice and loud, and um, it's nice and quick. It's just a good little horn beep. Uh, it does have push button start. Here in the center console, we have what, I mean, was basically designed by a bunch of drunk monkeys. Below the knob that changes the car into four wheel drive mode, there is this little storage space, which like can fit a roll of quarters, which is kind of like the rest of the storage in the car. Like right here, for example, you've got something that can really only fit a thing of quarters. It can't fit like a cell phone or anything. You have the cup holders that have this little rubber thing in it, which allows you to fit a smaller drink. Now, uh, in fact, it even says on it, remove for larger cups. Now you'll notice that my Forerunner is missing one of those. That's because somebody with a larger cup put their drink in it 
And when they took their cup out, they walked away with, uh, they had one of those little reusable bottles, they walked away with it. Now that may happen to a lot of people where it will accidentally get stuck to the bottom of the drink. And then this one isn't quite big enough, but it gets stuck to the bottom of the drink, they walk away with it, and now you don't have your little cup holder thing anymore. It seems to me that Toyota could have just taken a page out of Lexus's book and just put the little spring actuated kind of like holder things in there to allow it to self adjust for bigger cups, but no, they went with this kind of asinine thing. Climate control system on the Forerunner is pretty standard. You've got dual zone in the Limited. It is single zone in pretty much every other trim package. Uh, you have heated and cooled seats in the Limited. They have only heated seats in the other trim packages. Uh, cooled seats are about as useful as a mouth, mouse blowing through a straw. The head unit, but that said, the buttons though are all sort of kind of laid out very intuitively. They're, they're all really nice and, and logical. Head unit. A lot of people complain about the head unit in the Forerunner. I actually think it's fantastic. The reason why is because even though it's sort of a small, sort of nine inch kind of outdated screen like the rest of the technologies in the Forerunner, uh, the fact is, is that it is very responsive and very fast. See, it has CarPlay and Android Auto that has to be done via a USB cable. It is not via Bluetooth. But that said, just sort of interacting with the screen, it's very snappy, it's very quick, it loads up very fast. The Honda Civic took like I don't know, it almost took like 20 seconds to basically turn on and sort of load up and then connect to your phone. On the Forerunner, it is almost instant. And the way that it switches back and forth between the uh, USB CarPlay and the Bluetooth if you unplug it, also very, very fast. I really, really like the head unit in the Forerunner. Uh, that said, they could have done a little bit of a better job with the cameras on the Forerunner, as I complained about earlier. Uh, if you look at the camera quality on the little small screen here, it's, well, it's almost useless. And I can't help but feel like they could have improved upon that if maybe they just, I don't know, maybe they just put a little bit of a better, better screen in there. I'm not really sure. But again, that said, head unit is good. Limited trim comes with a advanced dashboard. Basically, that just means that sandwiched between the RPM, the tachometer and the speedometer, uh, sandwiched between those is a little color screen. Looks like it was pulled out of a Volkswagen from 10 years ago, but that's what uh, Toyota considers advanced. Uh, you do have a little place for your sunglasses right here. You've got your A-Track, which is sort of like a locking, a sort of virtual locking differential system, a little downhill auto control thing, controls for your sunroof and all that stuff uh, right here in this top cluster. Uh, you do have the little analog clock still at the top. Now, I actually really love the little analog clock at the top there. It's kind of like a little Japanese Casio throwback. But one thing that kind of annoys me, and again, this is nitpicking, is that five inches below the beautiful analog clock, you have the clock again on the head unit. It just kind of feels like they could have used that space for something else. But no, you've got the clock, uh, again, two, you've got the clock twice, two inches in front of each other. Also, those clocks do not sync up together. So that means that the clock on your GPS is going to be, or can be, different from the clock on the little analog thing at the top there, which uh, really, really annoys me. On the limited trim, Toyota was nice enough to give you uh, automatic seats on both the driver and the passenger side, and they even gave you two memory seats for the uh, driver as well. Now that said though, on pretty much every other single car I've ever driven, and I've driven a lot of cars, the memory seats are linked up to the mirrors in that when you adjust your mirrors and your seats and then you save it into the memory position, basically when you hit the button, it kind of adjusts all that stuff back to where it was. Not so in the Forerunner. The seats are the only thing that is linked to the memory seat button. The mirrors, on the other hand, you will have to manually adjust every single time you get in and out of the car if somebody else messes with it. Another little kind of interesting quirk there. Now, the windows on the Forerunner. As I mentioned in the back of the car, it is automatic. They have automatic all around on the Forerunner. But it's so funny because Toyota is so proud of the all auto, auto buttons on, uh, window buttons on the Forerunner that they just sort of put this big badge on there that sort of just says, hey, all auto, all of them can do it. Kind of a cool little fun thing there. Forerunner Limited does not have automatic windshield wipers, something that I really wish it did. I constantly find myself fiddling with the windshield wiper stock. It kind of gets a little bit annoying. Uh, again, I get it on an SR5, but on the Limited, come on guys. Um, but you do have this little button, uh, cluster of buttons right here uh, by the left leg. That has the, uh, the automatic headlights. So basically, if you were driving down the road and you've got your high beams on, it will automatically switch them to low beams if it detects oncoming traffic. It works just about as well as the Honda Civic. It works better than it does in the Tesla and the Ram. It does not work as well as it does in the Ford and the Range Rover. Uh, you also have the buttons for the mirrors. You have the little camera button here, which allows you to switch between the multiple views. You have the button that turns on the outlet in the trunk, 
and then you have the little button. This one that's got the little squiggly line on the windshield. That is the one that turns on the uh, windshield wiper defrosters. One thing that I don't like about these buttons is that most of them are not backlit. So at nighttime, you will not be able to see them. That includes the mirror buttons that you have to adjust when somebody else adulterates your mirror position. That is something that kind of really bugs me. In general, the Forerunner does not have a lot of usable storage. This little pocket here on the door is borderline useless. Uh, we have found that the water bottle holders uh, and the actual side pockets there can fit like basically just a small water bottle, which I guess is fine. But other than that, that's about all the storage you get. The center bin here, it's got like a little area for tissues. It even has a tissue logo on it, which is kind of funny. It is deep. It's not as deep or cavernous as it is on the RAM or anything like that, but it's still, you know, it's still pretty decent. But that said, just the storage in general in the Forerunner is not sensical. I mean, again, look at this center console. I mean, this little thing right here where I guess you can kind of like put your phone, um, but there's not really a logical place to put your phone. This little center storage spot right here is very shallow and not very deep. So I don't know. I really wish Toyota did a better job at the interior layout on the Forerunner. Three last things I would like to discuss about the Forerunner interior. You do have an automatic dimming rear view mirror, but as I mentioned earlier, the side view mirrors do not dim. Kind of feel like that was a misstep on their part considering the size of the mirrors. Now, two features that I find particularly fun about the Forerunner is that when it rains, all of that water will collect on top of the roof. If you decide that you want to open up your sunroof after a nice rain, let's say it rains the night before, then it's sunny the next morning, and you decide you want to open up the sunroof, when you start moving, that water will all pour through the sunroof. Uh, have, have never had a car that that has happened before, uh, but the water pools on the roof and there is no sort of like edge or gasket or anything that then prevents that water from going in through the actual sunroof opening. That is really, really freaking annoying. The first day we got the Forerunner, my wife got drenched and I got a mouthful. Another really fun thing about the Forerunner is that the passenger seatbelt, when you have all of the windows open, including the rear one, will just sort of bounce up against the plastic here. Yeah, that's something that I, I love to hear is the slapping of the seatbelt up against the side. Anyway, let's go ahead and drive the Toyota 4Runner. All right, so we are driving around Bethesda, Maryland in our Toyota 4Runner. The first thing that you will notice about the 4Runner is that it is exceptionally quiet. In fact, the Toyota 4Runner is still made in the same plant as the Lexus's, Lexi? As the Lexus are still made. The entire body is mostly made of steel panels and it's a big truck frame and all of that good stuff, but the formula, the, 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 uh, all of that basically equals a car that is just, it, it just feels like it's built like a tank. Again, it's quiet, it's firm, it's planted, that said, I am not the biggest Forerunner fan. I am firmly in the camp that the Forerunner is outdated and needs to, and is in desperate need of an update. Now, that's not to say that it doesn't have the looks, because frankly, if you are looking for an outdoor, rugged, kind of masculine SUV, there are very few options better than the Toyota Forerunner. You have like the Land Rover Defender and you've got the Bronco and there's maybe a couple of others like some Jeep Wranglers, for example. But the point is, is that the Forerunner is still one of the best looking SUVs out there in, in terms of something that just kind of looks like it can go off road and, and do its business. Even the Telluride just looks a little too luxury, even with that new X-Pro model. The problem is simply that it doesn't have the creature comforts that most newer cars have. Now, I'd argue that the less there is in a car, they're also the less there is to brake, which is kind of nice. But the problem is when you get down to that V6 with that five-speed transmission. Going up a hill in this car is sluggish and passing people is frankly a little bit sluggish as well. You just don't have that power that you want. And 270 horsepower is fine for most practical things, but if you're somebody that's looking to tow like a big yacht or a big trailer full of cars or a bunch of other crap, the Forerunner just doesn't have the beast mode to do so really. And that five-speed transmission is surely one of the things responsible for making the absolutely wretched gas mileage. For example, the Ram 1500 gets probably about an average about 23 miles per gallon in the highway. How is it that a big burly pickup truck can get better gas mileage than a 
tiny little forerunner. It just doesn't really add up. Another complaint that I have actually about the drivability is that sometimes it kind of fights between fourth and fifth gear. It just doesn't really know what gear it wants to sit in, especially when you are going up a hill and accelerating, it just bounces between the two. So if the question is, should you buy the Forerunner for yourself? Well, the answer is this. If you want something that has the rugged good looks and the capabilities of overlanding, but you don't really care about luxuries or a sensible layout, and the Forerunner is going to be absolutely one of your best bets. If I have one last sort of complaint about it, I guess it's also the, the running boards. Running boards are useless and very short. If you have the Nerf boards from the TRD Pro, they are absolutely much more practical and useful, but the running boards that come on the limited, the non-automatic ones, uh, you might as well not have them at all. But those things aside, if you don't need the luxuries, you will find yourself very, very happy with this car. It will be a no frills, but no, BS kind of truck. It'll be good for you and your kids and your kids' kids. I don't love the Forerunner, but I do recommend it. I think that if you buy one, you will be happy with one. You just gotta know what you're buying first. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Hope you had a nice time watching this video. Please like and subscribe, and we will be back with another video really soon.